So the name of this talk is Ruby CI with GitHub Jenkins and EC2 Spot instances because when Jenkins was calling for talks, they were talking about non-Java languages and cloud-based things, and I just threw everything at the wall. So um, this is about a little bit of all those, and if anybody actually has any questions, we can focus on individual parts of that. So uh, I hate these slides, but they're everywhere. So I'm John Russell. I'm the director of tools at Tapjoy, and uh, the thing I tell everybody is that we make tools so that product engineers do the right thing in all the different ways that is. So really quickly, this story is about Ruby and RSpec, but it really isn't that specific to Ruby, but we can talk about that if you like. Um, unit testing, although again, it could be any other Jenkins job. Um, spot instances on AWS, it's a little more like that. Um, what the use cases are for spot instances, a lot of people are terrified of them because they could disappear at any time and you don't really know. So uh, we've actually done a lot of work with spot instances and are kind of familiar with the pitfalls, the good, the bad, and all that other stuff. Uh, parallelization, uh, using spot instances to make things go fast. We'll talk about what our use case was, but really, Anytime you need to do things, um, splay them out and then bring them back together, um, this is a this is an interesting use case for that sort of stuff. Um, money was along with all this parallelization, especially in AWS, gets really expensive to run this stuff. That goes back to the spot instances and how we're using them and why. Um, of course, we're using Jenkins to actually do all this stuff, and the story just goes on and on and gets pretty awesome from there. So this really story really is about TapJoy Server. And uh, this is a Java community, so I probably have to explain the picture, which is um, when anybody starts a Ruby on Rails project, they start just the Ruby on Rails project, and it gets um, adds all you know all the stuff that goes into the Ruby on Rails project, and you need another thing, so you just add another controller and another model, and you just get, and it just gets bigger and bigger. And then if you have a successful company, you've been doing that for a long time, and it grew very organically, and it is now the monorail which is what this is. Um, everything in the kitchen sink is, is inside this thing, and it's kind of hard to tang untangle it all. So what we have is a whole pile of unit tests, like seriously a lot of unit tests. And even though they're supposed to run fast, some of them run slow, but even with that amount, they're going to take a long time. And this is a very, very long time. It takes even longer than this on someone's laptop. It, it takes, um, this is you know the, the actual continuous integration servers doing this, but on someone's laptop, it's just, it's an infinite amount of time for a developer. There's no way they're gonna wait for this. That's not continuous. You can run your own unit tests, the individual ones, but then you don't, you know, you don't get the full strength of a uh, full suite of tests. You don't know if you broke things in other areas. It's, it's very difficult to do. So, what can we do about this? Of course, we are going to try to parallelize this. That's what you do with this sort of thing. Parallel tests is a, uh, a toolkit for basically doing this sort of thing, running them all at the same time, and it works really well. Um, you tell it to run RSpec, and it starts a whole bunch of different processes and hands out the files. Sounds great. We're done. We're not done. Another thing about Ruby projects, not just Ruby projects, all projects in the world, is that they end up with cruft. And we have all these tests that have been coming along from all the different places, and they all use the database in kind of different ways, and they all assume things like they count the number of rows and tables, which when you're running in parallel, it doesn't really last for very long before things start to break totally randomly. And the only thing worse than a failing test is an intermittently failing test. And that's exactly what we have. And this is not the pro a problem with unit testing in general. This is a problem with our tests. So really, um, what we have to do is, no, we absolutely have to parallelize this. There's no other way to, to do this, but if we can't do it all in one box and all in one database, what do we do? So we have Jenkins. Um, everybody knows what Jenkins does. We also have GitHub. That's where all the code is. So really quickly, we're going to start this story off with you know, the connection between GitHub and Jenkins. Um, people today have talked a lot about the GitHub uh, pull request builder, which is a fantastic plugin that talks to GitHub and does all these amazing things. So. We want the source code. We make sure you get all the permissions right, because that killed us many, many times. But OK, so the developer starts. My PR is awesome. What are we going to do? Code goes to GitHub. They push it up to a branch. They open a pull request. It goes over here. This is not uh, you know, parallelization or anything. This is just how the, the GitHub pull request flow works. But it gets to Jenkins. And then Jenkins does something magical and then tells the pull request that it's done. So what is it actually doing? And, and this is where we had to, make, we had to do 
some of the fanciness and, and get into the more interesting parts of this. So um, my brother is actually excellent at presentations, and he always tells me that you're supposed to leave things consistently in the same spot on the page. But I needed to move Jenkins, so I want to leave this slide and then move it over there. So keep your eye on Jenkins. So what Jenkins is doing now is um, using the build flow plugin. Now, if you guys saw the, uh, the keynote this morning, um, you, you saw the talk about workflow plugin. If you go to the build flow plugin website now, it says, hey, you'd probably be interested in the workflow plugin, because I'm not trying to be a hipster or anything, but we were using this like a year ago, and it's kind of, I guess we're moving on towards something else. Um, but anyway, you're using the build flow plugin. It is very similar to what the workflow plugin is. It's a Groovy DSL on top of throwing Jenkins jobs around. You can run them in parallel. You can wait for individual ones. So we're using the build flow plugin. Um, so we have Jenkins, and these are spec files. Spec is just the word Ruby uses. But again, this is not a, a Ruby solution. This is just a parallelization solution. So we pass all these files over to the spec build flow. And this is the, the Ruby DSL. So what it does is it takes all of these. I, needed, I couldn't find an animation that actually slid across, but I wanted an animation there, so I made it spin. I don't know. So the, what it does is it sends all of these out to individual spec runners. Now, what a spec runner is is another Jenkins job that actually runs the spec files. What the build flow does and this is very applicable to the, the workflow plugin that was being talked about this morning, is it takes the files, does a, you know, a mod by the number of files, and comes up with a, a corpus of tests that it wants each spec runner to run. And each one of those is going to go off and do that, and then all the results come back up. And at the end of the, the day, we have all these tests, but they all ran in parallel. Now, in order to get these to run, you saw how long our test took. We run these. 25 wide. It, it's it's a lot of uh, a lot of specs to run, and this is for every pull request. So someone, you know, developers are coming in, and it's not just every pull request; it's every commit to every pull request. So people are pushing, and they're like, "Oh, I forgot that thing," and then they push it again. And Jenkins is just churning through all this stuff. Want another animation there? Um, so that's a lot of jobs. I mean, like a ton of jobs. So if each one of these is going out onto its own slave, which we talked about. It has to because the databases can't be shared. That's kind of a, a straw man for you need to parallelize anything. I mean, that's our stupid use case, but it's parallelization of any kind. We went to AWS, because that's honestly what we go to for everything. It, is, it works really well. So there's the EC2 plugin for Jenkins, which is phenomenal. Um, it also has a feature where you can ask for spot instances. Because like I said, if you're going 25 wide and you're doing this for lots of different builds, you're very quickly up into the 150 nodes. And that gets really expensive if you're running those all day. And our DevOps guy, Wes, comes over to me and yells at me because we're using too much money. So we have to do something. So we can run these on spot instances. Now, um, I don't know how many of you actually use AWS, but spot instances are a, a little known feature of AWS that it's a way for them, I guess from their point of view, it's a way for them to sell off their excess capacity. For in, in Amazon, if you want an on-demand instance, you go and you give them a certain amount of money per hour, and they give you a box forever. Uh, you, can, you can always have that one, and when you're done with it, you give it back, but you'll keep it forever. Spot instance, but it's, Amazon is relatively expensive compared to, I guess, if you run your own data center, each instance would be less expensive. So what Amazon does is they make a spot market. What a spot market is, is in every region, in every, for every instance type, they have their excess capacity, and you can bid on it. Like, I want to pay 10 cents for this instance that could be a dollar. And if your bid is above the current market price for that spot instance, you get it. As soon as the, the bid price, uh, as soon as the spot price goes up above your bid, your instance is gone. So this is really cool. You can get an instance for possibly 10 even more times cheaper than you would normally get it. But it could go away at any moment. This is not a good way to run your production servers. This is a terrible way to run your production servers, especially since if there's a spike in the spot market, you are going to probably not be able to get your instance back right away either. Like you lost your instance and now it's still gone and the spot price is $5 for a $1 instance because honestly people automate stuff and they just keep bidding higher and higher and higher and it gets away from you. It goes away after a while. But this is what we use spot instances for. 
if we lose a spot instance during a test, it's not the worst thing in the world. This is a great use case for spot instances. If you use AWS, I suggest that you, you look into this sort of thing because it's, it's scary at first because, well, if I lose the instance and I can't get it back, that kind of you know, sucks. But this is a great place to use these things. Another place we use spot instances are our production sandboxes for developers. We put all of our stuff into one box and give it to developers with you know, whatever branch of the code they want on it. And they use it for anything, and they're all on spot instances, so they're really cheap. And we can run, we run 50 or 60 of them, pr pretty much one for every developer. And they get to use these whenever they want. Occasionally, we lose them. Once every maybe couple of weeks, we have what we call a spot apocalypse, where someone, some, someone in some other company, honestly, bought a bunch of spot instances. But we always just jump to another instance or jump to another region, and everything's fine. I'm, I was going to say that I'm not going to tell you what region we're in, but since no one's listening, uh, no, I'm still not going to tell you what region we're in. Because you go find your own region. We found a very stable one. The spot prices are really level, and they stay that way, and we like it. So stay out of our region. <laughs> um, so how does this work? The EC2 instance, the, the EC2 plugin kind of flips the, the spot instance, oh, I'm sorry, it flips the, the slave model on its head. Usually, this, the slave is there, you configure it, and then you tell master, OK, go and connect to this thing. You know, SSH into this thing, drop all the, all the, the jars on it, and have it connect. So this kind of go, does backwards. It creates the, the server side, the, the, ma, the Jenkins master concept of the slave, but there's no computer on the other side of that. Then it makes a request to Amazon, and Amazon takes its sweet time getting you a spot instance, I'll have to say. So we usually leave these running for a while. But you create a new, new spot instance request, and you've baked an Amy before that. And if, I don't know if you're any familiar with AWS, and Amy is just a virtual image. It's you know, the, the cookie cutter of your image. And on that Amy, as soon as that box starts up, it's going to go back to Jenkins and say, hey, I'm a spot instance, and I'm here. Um, you can also have, uh, there's also a little ID that goes with starting up the box. The box knows like some environment variables when it starts. So it knows its node name. So it wakes up, it goes back to master, and then maybe two or three minutes after you ask for it, you now have this slave. But before that, it looks like it's disconnected. It looks like it's broken. So there's always a little pitter-patter of the heart when you're not sure if it's all working. But once you get it working, the box comes up, it talks back to Jenkins master, you now have a node. It's 10 times cheaper than another node, and it looks and acts just the same. It's great. So Amazon grants, grants the spot instance. You now have a slave to work with, and you send all those jobs over to the, to the slaves. Now, the spec runner job I was talking about is a job like any other. It it's, uh, you know, runs your unit tests and collects the, the results. In this case, it's running 1 25th of our test results, but we don't care. It's just you know, running some tests. It knows what files it has to test. It goes and does it, and it comes back. This is, you know, you've seen the build executor, but you see all the gobbledygook under the, this, the nodes. You know, they're just named randomly. It's actually not really relevant what they are. And you know, Andy's over here during his talk was saying that your, your Jenkins slave should be completely interchangeable. They should be totally disposable. This is exactly what they are here. They're, the Amy's are exactly what they need to be when they come up. They come up, you use them, they can disappear at any time. If they disappear during the build, your build will fail. You can, you know, we, we tr there's logic in there to retry it a certain number of times. But there's really not, um, this is how these spots, the, the slaves are supposed to be. They can, they're completely interchangeable. So then you get the queue that builds way up with, with spec runners, but you've started up a whole bunch of instances, and then the queue goes down really fast. Um, everything is running on all of the different spots. It works just like it normally does but you're running it really cheap. So now, these all run, and they're on the Amazon spot instances, and they're chugging along. And this is actually something that I really want to look into with the, uh, with the workflow plugin. Because with build flow, there's not, it coordinates the build flow. But there's not a great way, at least when I was looking at this, to bring all the artifacts back together. We have to like do some local copying and stuff. And you know all the specs get back. They're here, and horrible things happened in order to get these test results to be all in the same place. Just, just dark things. Like, um, there's a bug in Groovy where it won't copy files right, and I had to write in Groovy exporting the text to a file, the Unix commands, like copy this thing over here into what is now a shell script, and then executing the shell script with Groovy. It was, it was not a good night, and I'm not happy about it. But, 
this thing all works now. It basically just brings all the tests back up to um, up all the test results up to the build flow. Now the build flow was launched by whatever project started this thing. The build flow is completely parameterized, which is another thing Eddie talked about. Parameterized builds are in fact fantastic. This thing can build anything. It, it, in this case, it's anything that's a Ruby project, but they all look the same to us. So you give it a GitHub repository and you give it a branch and it goes and get it, gets it and does all this stuff. So this build flow is uh, th this always the second thing that runs. In fact, if I go back here, um, you see here there's the, uh, you probably can't see the mouse I'm using over here. There's the Tapjoy server build that's there, which is, happens to be our main repository, but there's also the spec workflow job right under that, so that one starts it. But this is how all of our tests run. Uh, now that we have more than just one project, which is really good, we have Tapjoy server, we have placement server, event server, all these other ones, they all work the same way, and they all start this build flow plugin to do the, uh, to do the specs. So then the results all go back to Jenkins. Spins around again. And now we have, we come back to where we left off with GitHub. And if you remember from the GitHub part of the story, Jenkins was on the other side and we wanna make sure everybody knows where everything is. So I'm gonna move that back over there. And then GitHub comes back. We update the PR because the GitHub pull request builder is a fantastic plugin. And I don't know if the person who wrote it is here, but I wanna give them a hug. Um, it works really well and it updates the uh, it updates the the pull request itself and we're good. So some of the lessons that we learned by going through this, like I said, we used Ruby for this, we used uh, unit tests, we had our own use case for why the parallelization needed to happen, but that's not the the salient part of this. The part was using uh, if you are running your infrastructure in Amazon or really anything. Um, how you can use this for parallelization, and specifically in Amazon, how you can use spot instances to greatly reduce the cost of actually running all this stuff. Again, 150 nodes are not cheap for the, you know, 150 is a random number that we, that is a, an expensive thing for our infrastructure, but if you're way bigger than us, it's still expensive relative to not having to do this thing. So um, some of the things that we learned from this is that uh, the reverse, model of starting the node but not having it be connected and then having it connect later is difficult to get right the first time. The Amy took a long time to, to get perfect and now uh, it, it works, but it was, it was kind of a trip to get there. Um, automation can totally crash the spot market. So we are probably the dominant player in our region for our instance of the spot market where we are. And I can tell this because when Jenkins gets away from us every once in a while, um, it asks for an instance and for some reason we aren't getting them and it asks for more, like there was a, there was a bug in the Amy. Um, not there was a bug in the Amy, I put a bug in the Amy, I, I know. So I put a bug in the Amy so that it wouldn't connect back properly and Jenkins needs a node, so it starts a node and waits a couple minutes and starts another one, starts another one, starts another one. And while I'm sitting there debugging this thing, it asks, you know, 500 nodes later, it has started all these spot instances and has paid for them and it is driving the spot market up and up and up and up and up. So, uh, yeah, I think everybody else lost their nodes that day too. Um, but yeah, so we have to be careful with, with that sort of thing. Um, the, the price just went way up and to the right and, you know, after, after that we made sure that we don't do that anymore. Also, it happened while I was testing, I set the spot price really high because I didn't want to get outbid. Anyway, automation can be a double-edged sword with no handle that spins when you hold it. Um, the GitHub pull request plugin, plugin while, it is, uh, while it is fantastic, uh, took a little while to get quite right, the permissions on GitHub and all that other stuff, but that, again, that is all working out. And I am now a committer to, I don't know about Core Jenkins, it's not Core Jenkins, but at the EC2 plugin, um, this is the craziest thing that I ever saw, and it took a hugely long time to figure out. If you want to see about it, I left a great comment on that pull request, so you can, uh, you can take a look at that later. It was about the difference between regular instances and spot instances, and when they come up, and what they think they are, and syncing data between Amazon. But it's a good story. Um, so, uh, the things that made this work are, that, honestly, Jenkins Plugins authors. They're wonderful people. Uh, they're very nice. The EC2 plugin people were great. They got the pull request in really fast. GitHub pull request made this work. Uh, Buildflow made this work. I am very excited to look at the workflow plugin because I'm sure that's going to be 
a, a probably a, a more integrated, tighter solution than the BuildFlow one was, especially since the BuildFlow website now tells you to go look at the workflow plugin, so it'll probably be pretty good. Um, like I said, BuildFlow plugin was great. Um, Scripler uh, is another thing that is fantastic. If you're not using the Scripler plugin, you should go find the Scripler plugin. It, uh, it is basically just, you can run arbitrary groovy code whenever you feel like it. You can make them build steps. You can do all sorts of stuff. And uh, it, it works incredibly well and makes a lot of this easy. Like we, we have Scripler plugins that say, start up 60 nodes. Because you, know, you don't want to wait for all these to start up every time you're running a test. So we have to say, you know, start this many of these and kill 100 of them and you know, how many do I have? And it's just a great way to do ad hoc stuff. I suppose we could, I could write a plugin that would do all this stuff, but um, lazy, I guess. I don't know, this is just easier. Um, so like I said, spot instances are great. Uh, they're a mysterious thing and a lot of people are very uh, hesitant to use them because they can go away. But in use cases like this, they save us a ton of money. And they, they are very infrequently a headache. When they're a headache, we've learned to deal with it. Honestly, Scripler helps with some of that stuff. If, we, if it gets away from us, we can kill them all, wait, and then start them back up in a different place. So um, I, I'd be glad to talk about spot stuff if you guys are interested later. So at the end of all this, we took all of our tests, and we brought the runtime down to eight minutes, which uh, is conceivable we could get it lower by adding more parallelization, but I don't, at this point, a lot of the, uh, one of the, the downsides of this is that there's overhead to starting to run tests. You gotta create the database, you gotta you know, migrate the database to whatever state it has to be, you gotta load up some test data. That takes us about you know, a minute or two, and a lot of these, the parallelization is down to two or three minutes. So if we added more, we're not really buying all that much. There's a law of diminishing returns. We found 25 to be about right. Um, I suppose if someone wanted to go back and fix the test so we could run more than one on any given box, it would go much faster. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of tests in there. Uh, so that is a little more continuous. So uh, this is me. If you want to reach out at Twitter, uh, we have a tech blog at Tapjoy. Um, we're hiring all the time, and we're doing some pretty awesome stuff, not just this, but all sorts of other things. Huge scale, big data, lots of problems. And uh, this was the last slide in the template. So thank you very much to all the sponsors for doing this. Woo!